Well, I'm glad to be here. I only wish we had a few snowflakes. <laughs> I thought coming out from Burlington today, a few might fall, but no luck. Um, would you believe it? It's 35 years ago I first came to Jericho. I was armed with a camera, a tape recorder, and a notebook. And I was determined to make a start in tracking down the ghost of Wilson Bentley. Before the year was out, I had made contact with two women here in Jericho. They helped me a lot. First one is Ellen Merle. She remembers I met her in the post office 35 years ago. And she told me a bit about Bentley. Uh, I think she told me about the volume one and two of the history of Jericho. The first one, 1916. The second one, years later, that she edited. And that was a great help. And the other person, of course, is Blair Williams. Blair has been a great help to me over the years. We have corresponded for about 30 years now, many letters back and forth, and she has told me a lot about Snowflake. And best of all, she told me initially people I could talk to who knew Bentley. So, all right, with that, Wilson Bentley. Uh, Bentley, I guess I should say, I've talked about Bentley many different times, many different places, and usually when I mention the name of Bentley, people say, Wilson, who? I never heard of the guy. So I'm going to assume that most of you have heard of Bentley. Now, if there's just one person here who's been asleep for the past 20 years, I'll take a minute or two and run over Bentley's life. He was born right here in Jericho, 1865, right at the end of the Civil War, he spent his entire life in the farmhouse he was born in. He made his living mainly as a farmer. And 66 years later, two days before Christmas, 1931, he died. But he was far more than just a farmer. Bentley fell in love with what he called his water wonders of the atmosphere. Um, the frost, the dew, the clouds, but most of all, it was the snowflakes. He had a passion to show the beauty of the snowflakes to everybody he could. I think Bentley, he saw in the snowflake a metaphor for all things beautiful on earth. And he spent the rest of his life trying to show this beauty to people. And tonight I'm going, to, I'm going to start out by showing you some slides. We're going to begin right here in Jericho. We're going to work our way back in time to about uh, the early 1880s. And then we'll have, I'm going to read something about Bentley. We'll let Bentley talk in his own words. So we're going to go back the slides, some reading from me, and back the slides two or three times. So I hope by the end that you have a good idea of what Wilson Bentley was all about. So I guess we can begin with the slides. Now let's see if we push this forward. In case you don't know where Jericho is, <laughs> you can believe it. The people down in New York and Massachusetts or wherever I give talks, they have no idea where Jericho is. And so I had this math made up. And I tell them they better get up there. When I first came here 35 years ago, I saw this. It was right across the street from here. It's now over at the center. I'm not going to read this to you. I suppose you've all seen it. If you haven't seen it, shame on you. Get over to the center tomorrow and read it. Um, well, I didn't have much idea where Wilson Bentley lived when I first came here. So I found my way to uh, this store, which I, guess, I think the Dessos run at that time. And I went in the store, and two or three guys were standing around passing the time of day. And I said, can you tell me where Wilson Bentley used to live? They looked at me, Wilson, who? Never heard of the guy. That's the reaction I always get. So I said, oh, he was called Snowflake Bentley. Ah, oh, why didn't you say that? Sure. And they said, you just go down this road to Richmond. You're going to turn left on the Nashville Road and go down to, oh, about two miles. On the right-hand side, you see Bentley's old house. He said, you can't miss it. There's a snowflake in the upper window. So I took off. 
Oh, I stopped uh, at the cemetery to get a picture of Bentley's uh, final resting place. He's buried there with his brother Charles, uh, their parents and grandparents. I continued on and I found the Nashville Road and I stopped to get this picture. I thought this was just a beautiful picture. I thought to myself, now this is just the kind of a valley Wilson Bentley would live in. I took off down the road. Of course, it's a still, a still a dirt road today, just like it was a, a hundred years ago when Bentley was here. I imagined the ghost of Bentley was hovering overhead as I went down this road. I stopped to get a picture. I continued on. I knew I had to be getting very close because there's Bolton Mountain in the background. And uh, there it was. I found the house. Of course, I knew it was the house because you see the snowflake in the upper window. Right there. Now, Bentley lived around the left side of the house. On the right side here, his brother Charles and their family lived. So we're going to swing around to the left side of the house. And uh, here it is. The thing to point out is that shed in the back. That's where Bentley took all of his snowflake pictures. For 46 winters successive, he worked in that shed. Of course, it was not heated, obviously. It has to be as cold as the outdoors. So let's continue on. We're going back in time. This is about uh, 1925. Some interesting things to be seen here. First, you see the snowflakes? Bentley mode that made those and put them under the porch. Uh, secondly, the rocks. Bentley was, among many things, he was a very good amateur rock collector. He had a great knowledge of rocks. He collected them from around the area and he wrote an article or two about the rocks. And here, another thing, Bentley in the 1920s, he sponsored Fresh Air Fund children from New York City. He felt that these children should have a chance to be out in the country away from the stifling heat of New York. And this woman is Florence Durlacher, a teenager at the time. I got in contact with her about 25 years ago and she told me some awfully interesting things about Bentley. Uh, that is uh, Mary Bentley, the wife of uh, uh, one of Bentley's uh, nephews. And here are the Shiner children. They live down the street from Bentley. Let's continue on. I like this. It reminds me of a Grandma Moses painting. Now you begin to get an idea here of the artist in Bentley. I'm sure he posed the scene and probably spent 15 or 20 minutes to have his mother there stand just right, his brother Charles on the porch, uh, Charles's wife Mary, and their first child. And everybody was quiet for the 10 or 15 second exposure except the cow. He couldn't get that cow to stand quiet, so it's a bit blurry. So, all right, I'll continue on. You grow funny kids here in Jericho. <laughs> Must be the water they drink. This, of course, is Halloween, and uh, Amy Bentley gave me this picture years ago, and she said, that's her right there, and these are her brothers and sisters. Here's another beautiful picture. You get an idea again. Bentley probably spent 15 minutes posing the people. It's very nicely framed. Uh, that's his mother. Of course, this is the maple sugar time. She's scooping up some snow. That's his brother Charles in the background. And I can hear Charles sputtering now. Come on, Willie, get that picture. He's probably saying, back up a bit, Charles. Okay, come forward. Uh, I don't know who these people are, some of the neighbors. And uh, I don't know who he is. But I think it's a great picture. Well, that's Bentley himself. Um, physically, he was not a very imposing person. Um, probably not more than 125 pounds. Uh, maybe five, two, three, something like that. I suspect he was in his early 20s at this time. 
Here you see another talent of Bentley's. He was quite a musician. He would play the clarinet, he played the piano, and he played the violin. So, as I say, he was a very talented person. Um, for one year, in his early 20s, he taught uh, music to help uh, supplement his living as a farmer. Well, here he is. Got to make a living. That's Willie Bentley. Uh, that's his nephew, Arthur, I believe. Uh, Charles's son. Haying time. And here it shows a bit more of Willie Bentley and his music. That's the band. That's Bentley right there. And I'm always impressed with the height of these people. See how short they are. 110 years ago, people were not nearly as tall as we are today. Uh, most of these people don't seem to be more than 5'4 five, or 5. But this was taken out in front of the uh, Bentley house. Here is a drawing of Bentley as a teenager. Um, he was about 15 years old. He discovered through his mother's old microscope the beauty of the snowflake. And he spent a couple of winters trying to draw this. He made two or three hundred drawings, but he was never able to successfully capture it because it takes a long time to make the drawing. And after four or five minutes, the, the snowflake just evaporates. So he knew he had to find another way to do it, and photography seemed to be the way. So, okay, if we could have the lights on then. Thanks, Ray. Um, then he was asked how he got going, how he got started. And in the 1920s, when he was very well known, he was asked that question. And this is what he said. It was my mother that made it possible for me at 15 to begin the work to which I have devoted my life. She had a small microscope, which she had used in her school teaching. When the other boys of my age were playing with pop guns and slingshots, I was absorbed in studying things under this microscope. But always, from the very beginning, it was the snowflakes that fascinated me most. The farm folks up in this north country, they just dread the winter. But I was supremely happy. From the day of the first snowfall, which usually came in November, until the last one, which sometimes came as late as May. Under the microscope, I found the snowflakes were miracles of beauty. I became possessed with a great desire to show people something of this wonderful loveliness an ambition to become, in some measure, its preserver. I had read, probably in my mother's encyclopedia, of cameras that photographed through a microscope. If I could have such an apparatus, I believed I could make permanent records of snow crystals. When I was 17 years old, my mother persuaded my father to buy for me the camera and microscope which I have developed into the apparatus I am still using. That apparatus, of course, is right back here. And if you haven't seen it, you should go out there after and take a look at it. It cost even then $100. You can imagine, or perhaps you cannot, unless you know what the average farmer is like, how my father hated to spend all that money on what seemed to him a boy's ridiculous whim. Somehow, my mother got him to spend the money, but he never came to believe it had been worthwhile. He and my older brother always thought I was fooling away my time, fussing with snowflakes. But I don't think my love of beauty made me a worse farmer. This was only a ten-cow dairy farm when my father died. My brother and I made it a twenty-cow farm, and believe me, I did my share of the work. He's always pointing out to people that he did as much work as anybody else. Um, okay, we'll go back to the slides then. I'll keep you busy, right? <laughs> I'm going to show you here pictures that were made, I think, in 1917. Uh, some movie, movie people came up, I think, from New York City. Uh, as I say, Bentley was getting pretty famous. And they wanted to make some movies of Bentley. 
and they took these still, still pictures at the time. Uh, it illustrates Bentley. Uh, he would be out there with a black board. Uh, it's not black velvet. I find that many, many people make mistakes. It says black velvet here. It's just an ordinary board painted black. He would catch the snowflakes on that. And then he would take a very small wooden splint, pick them up, and put them on a microscope slide under the observation microscope. Um, let me point out a couple of things. First of all, Bentley never dressed like that. You're working out in that shed. You don't dress like that. I think he was probably hopping mad that the people made him put on his best clothes. Uh, and secondly, this is all outdoors. They probably could not get their cameras or movie cameras or lights in that shed. So they had him work outdoors. That's all right. Okay, here he is now. He has picked up the snow crystal. He's putting it on the slide. And that pencil-like thing, like a telephone pole, it was not nearly that big. He used a very thin wooden splint. But I think they had to use that so it would show up in the movie. Okay, another thing to show about this, a um, rather amusing thing. I was talking about this to Mary Bentley, who was the, uh, the wife of Ulrich. They were living on the other side of the farmhouse at that time. And she told me, she was there at the time, she said the movie people came up and it, it wasn't snowing that day. There was some snow on the ground. So what they did, they put a lot of snow in a bushel basket. They had Ulrich take it up to the second floor and he stood there and he threw the snow out. <laughs> Handfuls. And this was falling down as they were taking pictures. And she said, Uncle Willie, he got hopping mad because big chunks of snow were coming down and hitting him. And you can kind of see a chunk here and a chunk there. So <laughs> that's the amusing part of that the, um, episode. I never would have known the humor in that part unless I had met her. Well, okay, here he is behind his camera. And of course, the camera is right out in back here now. He would put his microscope slide up here in front of the uh, microscope. He'd get them back. He'd have a plate in there. He would, these wheels on either side, he would get his focus, and he would make his exposure. The exposure took maybe uh, 10 seconds to maybe a minute and a half. Now, he did all the pictures by what we call transmitted light. The camera was in the shed, but it was pointing out through a window. So when you take the picture, you get the snowflake with a white background because you're looking out through the snow. Well, Bentley didn't like that. The artist in him said, if we have the snowflake against a, a white background, it's not very beautiful. I want to have a, a black background. So what he did, he never touched his original negative. That's the genius in Bentley. He made a duplicate negative. This is a glass plate negative with the emulsion on one side. And he would sit there do that and cut away all that emulsion around that snowflake. And this may take half an hour or it may take two hours. But he was very patient in cutting away. So when you project that in the screen, you can see the clear part. Um, what am I talking about? Oh, when you make your print. The clear part comes out black. Uh, one more thing I want to say about this. Oh, Bentley had, there was no electricity out there in the farmhouse at that time. So how did he make these contact prints? No electricity. What he did was to <coughs> make it with the light of a oil lamp. He had an oil lamp. That was his light source. And in his notebooks, he says he would have his uh, uh, contact uh, plates there, two door lengths or four door lengths away from the oil lamp. That's quite amazing. All this was done without any electricity. And he did this for nearly 5,000. Okay, Ray, get your exercise again. Well, all right, I've showed you how he did it. 
Uh, you can imagine there must have been pretty, uh, a, a lot of difficulty that Bentley faced. This was 1883, 84, 85. Uh, nobody had done this before. Nobody had seen photographs through a microscope. In fact, the photomicrography was pretty new, a pretty new science. So um, Bentley was asked about the difficulties he had. This is what he said. I shall never forget the dif disappointments that followed my first attempts. Here I was with this expensive apparatus which had been given me so reluctantly. I had been sure I could do wonderful things with it, but I failed over and over again. If there had only been someone to explain what was wrong, but away off here in the farm, there was nobody to help me. The winter slipped away and I was almost heartbroken, but the next season I had found the secret of my trouble. I began to use a very small stop, a thin plate, with a tiny opening to shut out most of the light. With this and a longer exposure, I got a clear image. And see, he's learned how to use an f-stop. He stops way down and you get a much better focus. The day that I developed the first negative made by this method and found it good, I felt almost like falling on my knees beside that apparatus and worshiping it. I knew then that what I had dreamed of doing was possible. It was the greatest moment of my life. This greatest moment that he's talking about was the 15th of January, 1885. He was still only 19 years old, and he had succeeded in obtaining the world's first photographs of snowflakes. Five years later, a German scientist got pictures. About the same time, or a year after that, a Swedish scientist got pictures, a Russian pictures, a Russian scientist got pictures. But by that time, Bentley was five years into his work, so he was the first one to get these pictures. Um, I think now I've been talking about these, calling these snowflakes. I should now get more scientific. What Bentley photographed was not a snowflake, it's a snow crystal. <coughs> In fact, Bentley's book is called Snow Crystals. <coughs> Snow crystals are really the building blocks of a snowflake, like bricks of the building block of a building. When the snow crystals, individual crystals, are formed in the clouds by the hundreds of millions, they grow as they fall, uh, they hit each other, they stick, they break. So it's like a demolition derby. You have all these crystals coming down, they stick together, and finally they come out of the cloud as what we call a snowflake. If you look at a snowflake falling on your sleeve, it may break up into about eight or nine pieces. If you're lucky, you might see a snow crystal, the type that Bentley was always after. If you're not lucky, you won't see it. Uh, you often have to go for minutes on end before you can <clears throat> find a snowflake breaking up into one of these beautiful snow crystals. But if you have the patience of a Bentley, uh, you will see it. Um, Okay, I think we want to go on into the slides again. I'm going to show you now some of these pictures that he got. And you can see how elegant they are. Now Bentley, of course, is the one who said no two snowflakes are alike. And what he meant by that was not the external shape. Of course, you can find external shapes. They're all hex hexagonal. <clears throat> the hexagonal symmetry is determined by the um, <clears throat> molecular structure of the water molecule, H2O. But what he was talking about is the internal structure. You see, these <clears throat> pictures were taken, as I said, with transmitted light. So you bring out all of the surface structure of the crystal. And it's very unlikely you will ever see two exactly alike. You can spend a lifetime, and I don't think you ever find two alike. Uh, this is a rather unusual one. Uh, we don't quite know why they form like this, <clears throat> these triangular shape, but they do occasionally. Uh, Bentley called this his man from Mars crystal. And it was that because, see the face right there? Two eyes, two eyes, the mouth. That's his man from Mars crystal. Um, 
we think that somehow chemistry in the atmosphere is something that organic molecules can cause these misshapen crystals. In the laboratory, you can produce these quite easily. This is an elegant one. And they're going to get more complicated in structure <coughs> as I take you along. And see the marvelous symmetry. And everything is sixfold. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, you're going to see these all the same size, although I don't think they're the same size when Bentley picked them up. He arranged to have them the same size. Unfortunately, Bentley did not tell us uh, what the size of the original crystal was. I think, though, they were probably the smallest ones, maybe a tenth of an inch, and the largest ones, maybe a quarter of an inch. But when he shows them in his book, or when he put them in his articles, he has them all the same size. So when you look at these uh, in your arm, uh, you may see some <coughs> maybe a fifteenth of an inch or smaller. And if you're lucky, you may see some very large ones. If you have a magnifying glass, uh, do bring that along and look at them through your magnifying glass. And now, there are many other types of crystals beside the beautiful ones that Bentley liked. There are these relatively rare. These are what we call the capped hexagonal columns. There are needles. Uh, these form at temperatures uh, only about 25 degrees, uh, <clears throat> not far below zero. And these are bullet-type crystals. And we have these twined. And there are many others. Um, there are some Japanese scientists a few years ago. They made a catalog of the crystal types. They came up with 80, 80 different kinds. I don't believe me. I can show you after. I have the catalog here. OK. Again, uh, this, I think, is an artifact. You see right there. I think something happened to the uh, emulsion. I had all of these uh, uh, slides made from some uh, <coughs> plates I had given to me years ago. About 100 uh, plates Bentley had made of uh, snow crystals and, and, and dew. And <coughs> excuse me, I gave them to the society about a year ago, and I think they're in the back room. Another one. <coughs> this is a beautiful hexagonal plate. And you see it, the very center. Can you see that spot? I suspect <coughs> that was a cloud droplet that froze. The ordinarily clouds, they do not freeze when the temperature gets 32 degrees. Clouds invariably will super cool. The temperature will go down to a, a 20, maybe 15. Maybe lower. But as soon as you get a cloud droplet freezing, why, bingo, you start the formation of a snow crystal. So, okay. I'm getting more complex here as we go along. Now you can see, remember now, Bentley's original uh, negative, if he had printed out the positive, this would be white. And he wanted to have the black background. So he scraped away all the emotion on the plate and then printed the positive and you get the black background. I think what you're seeing here is either, I don't believe, Bentley may have breathed on the crystal at the condensation of the breath. I don't think that's true because he warned of that in a couple of his papers. And so I think he obviously knew you had to <coughs> turn away, not breathe on it. I think what may have happened, this may have fallen right through the edge of a cloud. Because these droplets, they could be the size of cloud droplets. And as soon as they hit the crystal, they freeze. Getting more and more complicated. Um, you see something in the center there? <coughs> now, by the way, this type of a crystal um, forms at temperatures about five degrees Fahrenheit, maybe a few degrees on the other side. So it's, it has to be pretty cold to get these crystals. And that's why you don't see them all the time. Now this, I think, is Bentley's favorite crystal, or certainly one of his favorites, because I've seen this in several of his articles. He always seemed to select this one. I like it. You're going to see it later on. two more. Now you can imagine the difficulty he had cutting away the emotion around all of that. 
I've had a couple of people tell me years ago they'd see Willie Bentley sitting in the window of his farmhouse and he was cutting away his snowflakes. They call it cutting his snowflakes. Another one. Very elegant. Uh, this was taken from a slide of Bentley's and on the edge of it he had written, you can't see it here, but on the edge of the original, among the choicest specimens of crystal architecture in a 25 year search. So they're very elegant. Uh, <clears throat> these I got from uh, the only scientific journal in Bentley's day. It was called the Monthly Weather Review. Uh, Bentley published a number of very elegant articles in the Monthly Weather Review from about 1901 to 1915 or 20. And uh, you can see that all different. There's one of those strange triangular ones. Here more. He called this one his clock crystal, the clock. And you can see why. Uh, incidentally, those little elongated like bacteria there and they're probably hollow in the in a lot of these uh, snow crystals there are hollow parts to them i don't know really how it forms i'm not sure anybody really does some of the japanese scientists figure they have a way to explain it but i've not seen it okay let's have the lights again All right, let me tell you a bit about Bentley. He, he was self-educated. Um, his mother had been a school teacher, so I suspect uh, she home taught him a bit. I don't think he had more than four, to, uh, four years of schooling. Uh, he was never married, although I think he came close to it once. Uh, I think he very much wanted to marry this particular girl. I'm not going to go into detail right now, but at the very end, somebody remind me and I'll tell you about the woman that I think he wanted to marry. Uh, his father died in 1887. Uh, his mother around uh, 1900 became an invalid and for the next uh, <clears throat> five or six years Bentley had to take care of her. And the final few years she couldn't get out of the second floor the bedroom so Bentley was going back and forth taking care of his mother. At the same time he was continuing his, uh, his work with the snowflakes. Um, he was asked what people thought about him. Again, in the 1920s when he was quite famous, they asked him what people thought. This is what he said. Oh, I guess they've always believed I was crazy, or a fool, or both. Years ago, I thought they might feel different if they understood what I was doing. I thought they might be glad to understand. So I announced that I would give a talk in the village and show lantern slides of my pictures. They are beautiful, you know, marvelously beautiful on the screen. But when the night came from my lecture, just six people were there to hear me. See, I've got more than six right here. <laughs> and the lecture was free, mind you. <laughs> and it was a fine, pleasant evening, too. But they weren't interested. I realized then that my hometown folks didn't have a very high opinion of me. A year or two ago, I again tried the experiment of giving my lecture here in the village, and my neighbors had interest enough to come. I think they found my pictures beautiful. They couldn't help that. I doubt, though, that they have changed their opinion of me. They still think I'm a little cracked. I've just had to accept that opinion and try not to care. It doesn't hurt me very much. Um, I think that very much at the end is quite revealing. Uh, you cannot work in isolation doing this scientific work. It's hard enough doing that uh, if you're connected with a university or a research, in a research institution. You have colleagues you can talk to. But Bentley was out there in the country. He had nobody to talk to. I can understand why the farmers out there in <coughs> Nashville Road uh, thought he was a little bit strange. Uh, farmers work very hard. I was brought up in the country. I know they work hard for a living. 
And they simply did not, did not understand what Bentley was doing. It was ridiculous to them that he was playing around with snowflakes and also raindrops. I haven't told you about his raindrop work, and I don't intend it too much about that. But he did some very elegant work uh, make measurements of the sizes of raindrops, measuring what we call the size distribution. And he was the first American to do it. And he was 30 years ahead of his time. So I understood why the farmers thought he was strange. <clears throat> Initially, I wondered why some of the scientists didn't pick up on some of his work. Initially, I thought maybe a certain arrogance. Some PhDs are arrogant. They look down their noses at people who do not have the so-called proper credentials and are not connected with a research institution. But I soon dropped that idea, and I realized that Bentley was just years ahead of his time. His work with the snowflakes <coughs> was 25 years ahead. His work with the raindrop size distributions was 30 years ahead. He was working in an area that we today call cloud physics. This did not exist when Bentley was around. Today, there may be 500 to 1,000 scientists around the world working in cloud physics. This is the area where I used to work before I retired. So Bentley was uh, out on his own. Um, well, let me tell you a bit about what I call the lighter side of life with Wilson Bentley. He loved to go to movies. I've heard many people, his, his nieces, other people tell me, he just loved movies. Uh, he loved to take uh, the neighborhood kids to movies into Burlington. And uh, he'd go by himself a lot. Um, I've gone through Bentley's notebooks. I've <clears throat> One day I was going through page after page after page of details about his photography. And I suddenly came across um, <clears throat> this note. Must see Mary Anderson in the half-breed. I don't know who Mary Anderson was. She's a movie star in the 1920s. But he wanted to see her in the half-breed. Um, I know he loved to see movies with Mary Pickford. I've heard uh, from his uh, nieces he just loved Mary Pickford. In fact, a couple of winters he sent her some uh, maple sugar. <laughs> and supposedly he got a letter back from Mary. True or not, I don't know, but the, that's what they say. Um, his music. As I said earlier, he could play the uh, <coughs> clarinet, <coughs> the violin, the piano. He loved to play the piano with square dances. There's one old timer who remembers it well said that, and I quote, Bentley with his violin entertained the villagers by imitating bird calls, frogs, barnyard animals, and certain people in the village. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bentley played jokes. There are other ones I could tell you, but I'm not going to take the time. Um, <clears throat> He would play jokes on people, and jokes were played on him. <coughs> and there's one I've got to tell you. This was told me by Arthur Pratt. I don't know if any of you remember Arthur Pratt. <coughs> he lived out in the Nashville Road, not too far from Bentley. Well, 25 years ago, when I was talking to Arthur, uh, he said that once when he was a teenager, uh, he was at a square dance. And Bentley was there, of course, playing the piano. And he said that he and a couple of his friends, they snuck outside and they <coughs> went to Bentley's horse and buggy and they reversed the wheels. Now the back wheels are bigger than the front wheels. So the back wheels went in front and this made it look like a very strange looking buggy. And they hid in the bushes to get Bentley's reaction when he came out. And I asked Mr. Pratt, I said, well, what was the reaction? And he said, there weren't none. He went home like that, and he drove that buggy several days before he noticed it. <laughs> I don't know what you call that. Well, I don't know what you call it either, but the <coughs> months later, I was talking to uh, Bentley's niece, uh, Alice Bentley Hamelainen. I told her the story that <coughs> Pratt had told me, and she said, yes, I remember that. And I remember asking Uncle why he is so different doing things differently from what the other people do. And Uncle said, Little Alice, don't you ever be afraid of being different. And I thought that was a wonderful remark because, you know, most things that are accomplished in this world worthwhile are done by people who are not afraid of being different. 
So um, she always remembered that. Okay, let's go back to it. Where are you, Ray? Hop, hop. <laughs> this will be the last time, I think. Well, okay, in the wintertime, when it wasn't snowing, uh, Bentley would be out there taking pictures of frost. Um, and here you see. Uh, he loved to take pictures of frost in the uh, uh, window pane of his farmhouse. <coughs> I don't, he never told the size of this. I suspect it must be about 8 or 10 inches across. <coughs> but you get <coughs> many different patterns. The frost can form. It depends on the temperature. It depends on the humidity. It depends most of all upon the what you call the substrate, whether you have scratches in the window or various organic materials. I suspect there was a scratch in the window right there, and you had the frost forming along that line. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but it's a very beautiful picture. Another one. I like to sh uh, show this to children. They have such an imagination. <coughs> they think of this as dancing figures. Now notice, you see that clear circle there with some ice in the center? Down here, it's clear with some ice in the center. And uh, again there. And Bentley spent a lot of time wondering what did that. And he finally came to <coughs> an explanation. He was wrong. But if he had properly explained what causes that, his name would be forever enshrined in the annals of cloud physics. He came up with the incorrect explanation of what caused that. He had an explanation. He extrapolated to the clouds, but he was wrong. Thirty years later, a Swedish um, atmospheric scientist gave the proper explanation. And every student in atmospheric science today, atmospheric science 101, understands what is called the Bergeron process, the formation of snow in clouds. Bentley came very close, but not quite. I wrote about this in my book. Uh, this is kind of fun. I recall years ago, as a kid, I had a pillow, a pillow fight with a neighbor. The pillow broke a bit, and we had feathers all over the room. And this reminds me of those <coughs> feathers from that pillow. Uh, another frost pattern. That's very elegant. You see, they're all very different. It reminds me of ermine on a king's robe, maybe. Well, in the summertime, he would uh, take pictures of the uh, water droplets on various plants. Now, you notice he got a black background. The way he would get that, he'd take a milking pail, he'd paint the inside black. Then he would put that behind the object he's photographing. So the camera is looking beyond the object into the black of the milking pail. So you get this very black background. I guess that's a strawberry leaf. And Do you know what that is? A grasshopper. A grasshopper and a flower. And now, can you imagine how that grasshopper could be made to stay there all night to collect dew? Now what Bentley would do, he'd go out in the meadow <coughs> late in the afternoon, he would catch a grasshopper, he would tie it down with a tiny thread. <coughs> so the grasshopper would stay there all night long. And then at sunup, Bentley would be out there and get his picture. And then being a very kind person, not wanting to hurt uh, animals, he would cut the thread, put the grasshopper down, and the grasshopper would go away wondering what on earth had happened to him. <laughs> But it's a great picture, all the frost. Uh, this grasshopper is not terribly happy about what happened. His antenna are down. But again, Bentley used the same technique. You recognize that. Caterpillar. Same technique. He would tie it down, collect dew all night long, come out and get the picture. You must recognize that. That's a portion of a spider web, the orb spider. And these are the radial strands that go to the center. And of course, this is all the way around, the centrifugal strand. And notice how uniformly all those drops are. And notice on the radial strands, it's pretty clear. 
I think that's because th these spiders have several different spinnerets. They can spin a thread which is sticky. They can spin, spin a thread which is not sticky. <coughs> they can s uh, spin multiple strands. So I think somehow they keep these clear. Uh, for what reason, I really don't know. But it's a, it's a great picture. Now, I said Bentley loved that photograph. See, that's his favorite, one of his favorites, <coughs> which he used. Uh, he would make a postcard. This is part of a postcard. And he uh, arranged these. I think you have one original here. I think it's on back. I think this is an elegant picture. <coughs> this is really a work of art. Uh, Bentley put this together from about 120 individual snow crystals. And here you have a snow crystal, a montage made from over 120. I located this in Weston many years ago. Uh, his niece, um, Mrs. Hamelin, uh, showed it to me. And she allowed me to take a picture. You see, this is out on her porch. Uh, this is about uh, maybe two feet high, two and a half feet wide. I don't know what's happened to this. I wish we could locate it. It, it belongs here. Uh, Bentley apparently made several of these. Uh, it was used, I think, in the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo in 1901. Uh, why Bentley never used this in his articles, I don't know. But he never did. It just seems to have disappeared. Oh, at the same time, I was talking to her. I told her, yeah, I've mentioned a number of people have told me that a movie was made of your uncle. And I keep asking people, where is the movie? And they say, they don't know. So I asked her that, and she said, oh, I have something in my back closet. And she went away. She came back about five minutes later with a small burlap bag. In that bag was a cylindrical container of film, 35 millimeter film. And she said, maybe this is something. <coughs> so I looked at the 35 millimeter film. In the first frame I saw, I saw Bentley. So I knew this had to be the movie. So she allowed me to uh, borrow it. I had copies made in, in um, uh, eight millimeter, 15 millimeter. I think you people have a copy here. I know the uh, Vermont Historical Society has a copy in Montpelier. So finally the movie has been found. There may be more of that movie around, but the, we at least have a part of it. Um, I th think that's looks like. Okay, let me say a few more words. Okay, Ray, hop to it. <laughs> um, I'll finish up now with the final days of Wilson Bentley. Uh, as I say, he worked for 47 years. By the late 1920s, thank you. <coughs> That's better. <clears throat> Let's say he was quite well known. <clears throat> he received honors. He received the first uh, uh, <clears throat> research grant ever given by the American Meteorological Society. He was made a fellow of the American Meteorological Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. That's quite an honor. And he, he wrote the articles on the uh, snow and, and, and dew and frost for the Ameri Americana Encyclopedia and the um, um, Botanica. And his article remained there for about uh, 10 years after his death. In March of 1931, he took a photograph of a snow crystal, 1st of March, 1931. That was number 5,381 he had taken. He had no way to know, of course, but that was the last one he would ever take. Throughout the summer of 1931, I think among other things, he was working with people in, in Boston and Washington. They had gotten together two or 3,000 of his best photographs. A couple of years before, these other scientists realized if Bentley died, a treasure <coughs> would be lost. And they knew they had to get a collection of these 
snowflake or snow crystal together and put them in the form of a book. So Bentley supplied them uh, with many of his photographs, and <coughs> they were in the process of being printed up. And I know he was very eager to see that book. Um, <coughs> the book did not come out as they thought it would in the summer of 1931. The weeks and months went by, and finally, a couple of days after Thanksgiving in November 1931, three copies of the book arrived. And of course, Bentley had to be overjoyed to see that book. If you haven't seen it, there's a copy of the book out in back. McGraw Hill, publish it. It's, uh, you can get a copy today. It's come out in paperback by uh, Dover Publications, and they've been selling it uh, steadily over the years. Um, he had the three copies of the book, and a week or so later, he had apparently walked home in bad weather, which he'd done many times before, but uh, this time he came down with a cold. He gave a copy of his book to um, his nephew Ulrich on the other side, and, and Mary. They had a copy, and Bentley persisted in going about his work. He was getting worse, though. In the 7th of December, he made an entry in the logbook, Cold North Wind Afternoon Snow Flying. Another remarkable thing about Bentley, for 40 years he kept a logbook of weather and he made entries three times a day for all these years. Cloud conditions, temperature, uh, uh, the aurora, he kept track of the aurora. Uh, when he went away, the few times he did, he had his nephew Ulrich make entries in the book. And as I go through these logbooks, I can tell when Bentley was away, <coughs> because you can tell different handwriting. The entries are made by somebody else. Um, <coughs> okay, um, he's not getting better, but he was a very stubborn guy. He persisted in going about his work. And, and finally, Clarence Shiner, who was working with Bentley at that time, uh, helping him run the farm. Bentley was spending so much time with his snow crystal work. Uh, <clears throat> Clarence told the people on the other side, you know, he's getting pretty bad. And he's pretty stubborn. You've got to do something. Uh, they tried to get him to come out of his room, but he didn't want to come. They had to play a trick on him to get him to come out of his room. They had a doctor come. They put him in the other side of the farmhouse where they could take care of him. <clears throat> they had a nurse come in to try to take care of him. But it was too late. On the uh, 23rd, of December, <clears throat> early morning, he died of pneumonia. The very next day, his obituary appeared in many different newspapers. I'm going to end up by reading <clears throat> just a, por a portion of what they said in the Burlington Free Press. There's a very long article there. I'm just pulling out a, a few sentences. This is what they said. Longfellow said that genius is infinite painstaking. John Ruskin declared that genius is only a superior power of seeing. Wilson Bentley was a living example of this type of genius. He saw something in the snowflakes which other men failed to see, not because they could not see, but because they had not the patience and the understanding to look. Truly, greatness blooms in quiet corners and flourishes under strange circumstances. For Wilson Bentley was a greater man than many a millionaire who lives in luxury of which the snowflake man never dreamed. As I said, <coughs> Bentley believed the snow crystals were a metaphor for all things beautiful on earth. And he more or less describes it here. <coughs> the snow crystals come to us not only to reveal the wondrous beauty of the minute in nature, but to teach us that all earthly beauty is transient and must soon fade away. But though the beauty of the snow is evanescent, like the beauties of the autumn, as of the evening sky, it fades but to come again. That's an elegant piece of writing. Um, I promised to tell you about how he almost got married. There was a school teacher around 1910. Her name was Mina Seely. And she taught at the one-room schoolhouse not far down the road from <coughs> where Bentley was. Uh, no less than four women have told me they both knew Mina Seely, 
and Bentley. And they said that he uh, was very much taken with her and wanted to marry her, but he never did. I think the reason was that Mina, she saw how that guy worked so hard with his snowflakes and his raindrops and everything else that he would never have time to do anything else. <coughs> so she probably did not want to get <coughs> too involved with somebody like that. Now, one poignant thing about that is um, in Bentley's notebook, as I said, I was going through it one day, uh, page after page of technical details, uh, about 1910 or 11. He said he took a picture of Mina Seely in the front room, and then he took two pictures, side view. Uh, two or three days later, he makes mention he took another picture. And then <coughs> two or three years go by, and suddenly I see a comment, a very cryptic comment. Um, <coughs> Frost, <coughs> Frost monogram Mina. Now what he means by that is, he said Frost <coughs> window pane monogram Mina. Bentley at one time, he had scratched his initials in the window pane. He knew that Frost formed to run scratches in the window pane. So he scratched W-A-B. And the next morning, the frost formed around those lines, and it said W-A-B. You took a picture, and you find that picture in the Bentley, Bentley's book, Snow Crystal. So I think he was doing the same thing with Mina. Frost, monogram, Mina. And this is kind of a reminder, he was still thinking about it all these years later. And I often wondered if he had scratched Mina Seely under W-A-B. Now how lovers do in the apple tree, they put the initial. I asked the Schulenbergers once if they ever saw MS and the Bentley's initial. They said no, they didn't. So I guess the original windows are, are still not there. Okay, I guess that's it. <laughs>